All right, most of you already know me. Uh, my name is Jonathan Corgan. I've been around the Grenada Radio Project. Uh, it seems like forever. Uh, I actually counted it up. It's just a little over 11 years now. I've been involved with the project in various roles, of course, starting out as a user back in 2004, um, and got involved uh, with the project management uh, back in 2005 and 2006. Uh, currently now uh, working uh, with Canoe Radio Project as the chief architect um, and primarily responsible for the software side of the project. So uh, with Ben uh, managing the project itself, uh, the software uh, role um, has fallen to me. What I want to follow up uh, Ben's intro presentation um, today on is a little bit more about the technical details about how GNU Radio works and some of the challenges that you might face in picking it up and using it for the first time, depending on what background you're coming from. That did not work. So as Ben mentioned, um, you know, software-defined radio is not new. It's got a long history. Guinea radio has got a long history. But what it has done is it's taken these techniques that people have become skilled at using for building radio systems um, in hardware and brought them down to a level where um, you know, off-the-shelf hardware that's very low cost uh, and general-purpose programming uh, or uh, general-purpose computers can be used to uh, implement the algorithms uh, using the original math that was used to design the hardware. Uh, so you're sort of cutting out the, the hardware middleman there. There are a lot of different trade-offs involved in doing SDR uh, between uh, implementing things on an FPGA, a dedicated DSP processor chip, um, a general purpose platform, a computing platform, uh, and now increasingly the use of GPUs um, to do portions of a flow graph. And we'll hear quite a bit about that um, um, from Dr. Clancy um, tomorrow about how uh, GPUs are being introduced into this um, in the, a deep learning context. The biggest challenge that this, um, that I have seen anyway in my experience in working with the students of our classes um, has been um, the shift in thinking to having to understand um, how to both utilize math and software uh, in a context that may not be familiar. Um, you know, if you come from an analog background, uh, then having to learn something like complex baseband uh, might be uh, something that is not, uh, uh, you're not very fluent in. Or if you're coming from a computer science background, a lot of the RF properties, a lot of the things that happen to the signal before you even get to it in Guinea Radio, uh, having to understand uh, those kind of things. And we'll have a presentation later today that talks in great detail about um, the kind of surprises that you'll get uh, when you go from the ideal world of math um, to and from uh, the real world of uh, analog hardware. Now, over time, you know, we saw in the history, uh, the very, very first version of Guinea Radio was in 2001. Um, it picked up a lot of steam around 2004 with the introduction of the USRP radio. Um, as Ben explained, that was purpose designed to be used as hardware for um, Guinea Radio. Um, before that, it was kind of a hodgepodge of uh, analog to digital uh, boards that would fit in your PC uh, or uh, TV tuner cards and things like that. Um, and at that point, the GNU radio software began to be adopted by an increasingly diverse variety of users. Um, of course, hobbyists uh, typically tend to be the first for these sort of things. It's been picked up by academia. Um, today, if you go look on Google Scholar, you see maybe five, ten papers a week where GNU radio is being used um, in the experimental section for, you know, testing some hypothesis about, um, you know, signal processing. Uh, you saw in the keynote this morning um, the increase in use of GNU radio just in the small satellite community. That same hockey stick, if you will, um, is, uh, you see this in GNU radio across many different fields um, that have been switching to using software radio for all the benefits that we've talked about. Another challenge this presents to us as the GNU radio project is the background and skills of all these different people that are not only users but developers um, is very, uh, very different. And so we have people coming from industry that, you know, have um, lots of experience in the RF world uh, or other people who have lots of experience in the software world. We have interested um, enthusiasts and students that are just learning a lot of these techniques. So we have to try very hard to strike a balance in how GNU Radio works, its features, what you have to know ahead of time to get involved. Um, 
you know, I'll talk about the Guinea Radio Companion and how um, you know, it's been used to broaden the base of Guinea Radio users. But there was a time when we didn't even have that. And so the, the barrier to entry to use the software was very high back then. But again, over time, this, this circle of, uh, of users keeps growing. Uh, and we're finding that um, you know, a lot of people are contributing back into the project, um, not just in making changes to GNU Radio itself, though that happens, uh, but much more so now people are publishing what they're doing on things like Seagram um, using our um, tool frame, or excuse me, toolkit to generate their own software independent of GNU Radio and then publishing that for other people to use. So we're seeing growth in GNU Radio um, primarily driven by what do people need from the tools and then what people are publishing that they make available to everybody else in the community. Now, in order to be successful here, you have to understand how all this fits in the bigger system. And even though it's software radio, you still need an antenna. I'd be surprised at how many people ask about that. Um, but the, the needs of dealing with real world RF do not go away, even if you're implementing most of the algorithms and software on a PC. You have processing where you have you know, some sort of RF system, it's an antenna, um, a you know, LNA, a receive filter, um, passband uh, analog RF going to some form of SDR hardware um, that then does um, digitization, conversion to baseband, and then some filtering and resampling. Uh, finally, you now have a signal in a format that can be processed more easily by software and that gets um, transported over some kind of bus system, you know, USB or Ethernet or PCI. Um, and then everything else about dealing with that radio signal would be implemented in uh, GNU Radio. Now there are um, heterogeneous processing environments where some of what you would do here can now be done in devices that have FPGAs. Um, in particular, the Edis Research hardware with the RF NOx system, which we'll you know, see a lot of this week. Um, is integrated into GNU Radio such that what still looks like a single application here actually has processing distributed over um, potentially multiple USRPs and the GNU Radio application running. Another, and I'm not going to explain the math, but uh, another challenge for people coming into software radio for the first time is that the sampling architecture tends to be um, different from what they learned uh, back in school. And hopefully if you're learning this now, you're learning about this up front. But when you have uh, traditional, you know, single sampler type radio systems that you see um, in older radios, your sampling rate, of course, has to be twice as high as your center frequency. And with um, complex baseband representation, you can reduce the sampling rate requirements to something that is greater than or equal to your signal bandwidth. And that's almost always, you know, much, much lower. You're dealing with signals that could be as low as 25 kilohertz, they could be 25 megahertz, uh, but their center frequencies, you know, IFs tend to be in the you know, tens of megahertz or, or higher. And so the hardware that you can use that creates these baseband signals as well as the amount of processing power that you need to uh, deal with them goes way down with a um, software radio system that is based on complex baseband. So this is a challenging concept for some people, um, especially you know, if you're coming from the com computer science area where you've never been exposed to any of this. And um, we get a lot of questions on our mailing list and we see a lot of uh, challenges with people using this kind of technology um, because they haven't quite internalized how this works. And a lot of times you're taught in school about what signals look like here and not what they look like here, which is of course what your application will be dealing with. Uh, the, the kinds of hardware that tends to be used with GNU radio systems, uh, I mean, this is a conceptual diagram, um, and, you know, everyone has sort of different variations on this theme. But you tend to have some amount of analog front-end processing that, you know, receives a signal, maybe bandpass filters it, you have some variable amount of front-end gain. And then you have a one-stage conversion to baseband. And so you're going directly from, you know, maybe a GPS signal at, at 1575 megahertz, that's five megahertz wide. Um, you're going to go directly to a five megahertz wide signal um, in the complex domain out of this mixer. And that's very different from, you know, superhead type multiple stage or, you know, multiple IF type systems 
um, that you may have seen. Um, again, not all systems used with Guinea Radio look like this, uh, but most of them do. Then you have the digital processing where your um, analog I and Q complex signal coming out of the, the front end gets digitized, passed into some device um, that can do additional trimming um, of the uh, frequency by shifting it through another uh, digital mixer, uh, and then um, rate limiting the signal down to a data rate that can pass over whatever transport you're using. It's almost always the case that you can digitize signals at a far higher bandwidth then you can communicate them to a PC. And so typical systems might get uh, you know, 25 megahertz wide gigabit ethernet, uh, a couple hundred megahertz wide with uh, 10 gig ethernet, or eight megahertz wide with USB 2. Um, you know, the, the systems all vary on this. But remembering that the signal that you're gonna deal with inside your GNU radio application, you don't get it until it's past this gauntlet. Um, understanding the kinds of things that can go wrong here, like DC feed through in your mixer, or IQ imbalance in the various components of your front end, those all have um, direct consequences into what you have to do in software uh, to either make up for that or things that just become impossible to do because of those impairments. And again, this afternoon you'll, you'll hear quite a bit more about that. Now, GNU Radio itself, um, as Ben went into in great length, uh, as an open source framework, um, we've taken great pains over the years to make sure that GNU Radio is something that can be completely integrated with all the rest of the open source software framework, uh, I'm sorry, software development environments that are out there. So we use the GNU uh, GCC compiler, we use you know, regular Python, uh, we interact with open source Qt, um, the uh, System requirements tend to be off-the-shelf Linux distributions, um, so we don't do anything that sort of forces you out of the open source environment. Another thing to um, emphasize with GNU Radio is that it's not an application framework. It's something to build DSP, applica or DSP functionality into an application that might have a bunch of other features and might be using other build systems and might be linking to you know, other software or might be communicating outside the PC somewhere else. And so, in contrast to some other development systems, uh, we don't give you an IDE that you stay within and when you run, you're within that framework. Uh, we give you sort of the upside down version of that. We give you a library that can be linked into a regular open source application of any type that you want. And so if you're coming from other environments, uh, that's also another shift in thinking you might have to make uh, to be able to use this um, uh, appropriately. Now the, the primary, things that you're going to think about, these signal processing flow graphs, um, as we call them. This is a data flow pipeline architecture where most of the lower level portions of your um, signal processing are gonna be in this um, streaming, uh, high speed streaming model, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, but it also means that uh, you have to think about dealing with control logic and dealing with events. So not all signal processing is just shoveling samples through a filter. You know, you're detecting events, you're measuring things, you're changing your configuration based on measurements, you might have error conditions, you might need to signal alarms outside the application. Uh, and so we have a system inside GNU Radio using message passing that allows you to, to build that into, um, uh, build it into your application. In terms of user interface, we supply with GNU Radio Companion the ability to make some simple um, sort of instrumentation like displays for doing testing and prototyping. But you can use GNU Radio with any display system um, that you want to write for. Um, writing a GNU Radio application for some, you know, for QT, for WX, for whatever, um, you know, TCL, TK, whatever you want to use, is no different than writing a non-GNU Radio application for that same UI. It also means, though, that you have to think about your UI. Um, we don't give you a ready-made um, framework to be able to just plug into our UI. Um, it's, it's additional thinking that, you, that goes into how to use this. And then of course um, Python and C++ are, are what we're built out of. Our signal processing blocks are all written in C++ for speed. Um, we wrap those in, uh, for Python and using something called SWIG. Uh, and then the outer application can be written itself 
Um, typically in Python, um, sometimes you can do it in C++ if you don't want, if you have a system where you don't want to have a Python interpreter sitting around. What that means is that the, the bulk of your application can be built, you know, you saw the, the flow graph um, uh, design that Ben presented. You build your application out of these blocks that are speaking to each other in this um, pipeline um, design where each of them are running on independent threads, um, possibly on independent um, CPUs if you've got you know, some number of cores on your system. What this means is you have to think about your application in terms of um, what's the best way to pipeline these operations. If you end up writing your own blocks, you have to make even more decisions about how much to do on, in, in one thread versus multiple. But that tends to be a more advanced application. Um, we have intentionally architected it this way because it scales up uh, linearly with the number of cores that you can throw at your problem. So on a high-end system where you're dealing with high data rates, say like OFDM, uh, or digital TV, you know, you can put, you know, multi-core machines, um, you know, on the task. On a low-end system with just a single core, you still have the same modular design, but now they're just running um, in sequence as needed uh, on that individual core. So by breaking this up into multiple blocks, um, or, excuse me, into multiple threads and communicating over shared memory buffers, uh, we've got a very high performance data flow portion of Guinea Radio. And of course, we have the ability to add metadata to these streams so the blocks can talk to each other in band. Not shown here, but uh, we have the ability to send asynchronous messages between blocks. And that facility tends to get used when you get higher uh, in the protocol stack where you're dealing with um, you know, packetized radio and you've done all your demodulation and you've done your, you know, um, figured out how long your packet is. Now you want to deal with it in chunks. Then our message passing system and something called PDUs becomes uh, a better way of dealing with that than the streaming architecture. Um, there's some work you can look at from Tim O'Shea uh, on his blog uh, that goes into quite a bit more detail about um, uh, using the message passing system in conjunction with this and when it's appropriate to do either one. Now the design flow when using GNU Radio um, the Guinea Radio Companion is optional, but it turns out that it's everyone's favorite way of doing things. Um, but you have a set of blocks um, and a flow graph that you construct using them. That set of blocks is either code we've already written and put in Guinea Radio's uh, core distribution, or they're blocks that you've written, or they're blocks that you've gotten from a third party and have installed onto your system. Um, and then you write a Python script that instantiates this flow graph and whatever um, control superstructure is around it. Um, and that um, actually gets to the point where, you know, GNU Radio is running in the background and your Python script is doing all the rest of your application. Now, the GNU Radio companion, um, in the early days, we didn't have this, uh, but this has been around for seven years, I think, now. Um, this lets you describe the flow graph in graphical terms. It does the Python generation for you. And so it makes it much easier to do simple flow graphs. But it actually makes it harder to do complex flow graphs. Because it removes the ability to use general purpose, purpose programming flow control uh, you know, structures or uh, to integrate um, more complicated processing. This is more for um, you know, pure data flow type uh, applications. And what people tend to do is, you know, they'll exhaust what they can do with GRC and then go straight to Python. And, you know, we've got a, uh, a number of times a year we'll get uh, mailing list threads that go on for weeks on how to basically go out of your way to make GRD, GRC do something um, that could be much more easily done in Python, but people don't want to go that route. Um, if, you're, if you are doing your own development for your own C++ blocks, there's an additional tool called grmodtool um, that you'll uh, hear about later. Um, grmodtool is the um, portion of our toolkit that generates a complete out-of-tree build environment for you to write your own code, compile it, and install it, but it's not part of Guinea Radio. You can distribute it separately, version control it separately, uh, and it has your blocks in it, um, and then it just shows up 
over here on the right, uh, along with the Guinea Radio blocks. The Guinea Radio Companion itself, um, as I mentioned, um, it's important to think of this not as a runtime environment, as you might be used to, but as a program generator. Now, well, I'll talk a little bit on Wednesday when I talk about Guinea Radio Future Direction, um, and on Friday during the Hackfest, about some ideas we have about actually turning this into a runtime environment. Um, but you don't need this around when you run programs um, written using GRC. In other words, you can use GRC to develop a Guinea Radio application, go to another system, install Guinea Radio, run your program on that system, and no GRC involved. And so the, the design of it being a program generator is useful um, in that respect. Uh, what becomes challenging is if I want to um, experiment with making these changes, I can't monitor those changes in real time. Um, I have to make my change, save it, regenerate the program, rerun the program. Oh, I don't like that. Okay, let me end the program, go back and do that. So again, one of the ideas that we are um, examining for uh, future capabilities inside GRC is to be able to run the flow graph in place and be able to probe and be able to uh, um, you know, query properties and parameters and, and use the performance monitoring capabilities that Ben mentioned to embed those directly into GRC as a runtime environment. Well, again, I'll talk about that more on Wednesday. Our block libraries that we ship with GNU Radio, we have several hundred of them. Um, they're starting to, um, the pace of new block development has gone down um, because the things that would be applicable to sort of all applications, uh, we, we've plumbed the depths of that uh, pretty much. And a lot of the new block development, what we see is from the community of people using GNU Radio, developing their own capabilities that might be specific to their application, um, but they wouldn't warrant going back into GNU Radio. Uh, ben mentioned the Volk library, so where we can, we use Volk um, to uh, accelerate uh, the operation of whatever signal processing uh, application, or uh, excuse me, signal processing features that we want. Uh, and again, we've also developed these things in a way to where they fit into this modular um, framework so that this block, you only have to define the behavior at its endpoints. Um, blocks upstream and downstream, it doesn't even know what's connected to it. Uh, and if you're writing a flow graph, you don't have to know about anything that's inside it. And so the, this, this modular framework uh, that operates on multiple threads uh, and our use of the Volk library makes GNU Radio very, very suitable for real-time fast operation on over-the-air signals. You can also use this as a simulation environment. Um, we have a set of uh, blocks for modeling different channel conditions. Again, more work from Tim O'Shea. Um, that you, know, you can write a transmitter, um, you can use a channel simulator, write a receiver, and when you get all that working, you can get rid of the channel simulator and connect it to an SDR, um, and it should all work, right? Um, <clears throat> but the environment is such that you can do this either over the air or in simulation quite easily. The platforms that you'll need to develop GNU Radio, we do have, uh, of course, many different uh, Linux distributions where it's prepackaged. Um, we have um, support uh, through Mac ports for Mac OS. Uh, and so anything that you can do here, I mean, this is pretty much equivalent. Um, there's a community maintained installer for the Windows port of GNU Radio. Um, that tends to be good for um, deployment uh, but uh, the development environment uh, is Visual Studio. And so a lot, of the, um, a lot of the sort of streamlined things that we do on the Linux platform don't apply there. And so if you're familiar with the Microsoft development environment already, that's great. Um, and we have that ability. Um, the vast majority of our users, at least the ones that I'm familiar with, will stick with uh, Linux uh, or Mac OS um, for what they do. The last thing to talk about is our live environment. Every one of you should have gotten a USB drive um, when you checked in or had the chance to get one. You can go back and get one if you didn't. This is a complete bootable Ubuntu Linux system that has the full GNU Radio um, system installed as well as about 20 of the out of tree modules that are on our Seagram uh, archive. Um, it also has the full tutorials.
documentation for getting your radio on it. So while this is not really a design environment that you're going to run for a long period of time, um, it's something that you can use very easily to try something out. Um, it just boots on a regular PC, it'll boot on a Mac, um, and you will want to go back and install GNU Radio the normal way, uh, and you'll want to have a full production environment where you can do your development. But for quick testing, uh, you can't beat it, because it's an ISO file, you can download it, you can boot it in a VM, you can make a DVD out of it, you can use something like UNet Bootin and make a USB drive, uh, and that's what you have here. Especially if you're sticking around for Friday, um, I recommend that uh, you use that USB drive uh, rather than try to waste time on Friday getting everything working. And uh, hopefully uh, this will be a good intro for you to get started and uh, quickly be able to uh, contribute to the project. Thank you. Are there any questions for Jonathan? Uh, where's the audience mic? Oh, there's Michael. Hello. Oh. <laughs> I just had a quick question about the user interface. It, it generates the Python code. Can it also pull back in Python code that's been modified, and will those changes be represented in the user interface? Unfortunately, no. Um, that's been a pipe dream of computer science for about three decades. Um, anytime you have something that generates code, making changes and pulling it back to the original environment is a very difficult idea. Uh, and, and GRC doesn't even attempt it. We have time for one more? Nope, okay, awesome. Uh, so we, have, we now have a half hour, well, 24 minute break until 11 o'clock. Uh, during the break, we have snacks put out in the catering room. So please go eat snacks and then head over into the booth room where all of our sponsors are set up with cool gear and showing off demos. And we'll see you back here at 11.